my dad always said, you know, you're gonna have to work harder than everyone else because you're a girl. I just wasn't, you know, wasn't strong enough to begin with. And it's Trushan and Holly Doyle in front. Trushan is now three or four lengths clear and he wins the Ulster Cup, Goodwood Cup. I want to be a champion jockey one day and was that going to happen? I didn't think so. You know, sometimes you've got to do what's best for you. Nashua gets right away to win the foul mistakes impressively. It makes you a bit greedy, doesn't it? Because when you get a taste of that high level success, you just want more and more. Holly, thanks for coming on. Great to have you here. I know you've got a real busy schedule and it's hard to, to fit you in, but we've got you here, which is the main thing. I'm going to start, as I do with everyone, with like a brief overview of your career, which is over 850 winners, multiple group ones, we don't know exactly how many, but quite a few. And you've broken every record there is for a, a female jockey to break, essentially, along the way, which is pretty incredible. But can you take us back in time into how you got into racing and what was that route into racing for you? Um, I, I grew up in Herefordshire and um, I've always been up around horses really my grandparents had arabian horses and um my dad's from tipperary in ireland and um he he was um a jockey himself and um my mum rode a bit as an, an amateur and um so i've always kind of been brought up around horses um i you know i had a, a great upbringing around them and um i don't know any different other than race and i'm a, you know for as long as i can remember i can you know be remember going point to point with my dad and racing the lorry and missing school because I wanted to go in the lorry with him to the races and um, things like that. So I don't know much much different, really. And you ended up at David Evans, which was sort of probably your local trainer as such, didn't you? Yeah, I um, started out at Dave Evans's, which is in um, Abergavenny, so it would be about an hour from where I'm actually from, uh, Lempster in Herefordshire. And um, my dad had a association with him because he used to break in a lot of his yearlings and... Um, do a lot of transport and work there so um he was you know one of the biggest flat trainers local to us so it was kind of the obvious place to go for me yeah and i imagine that was like a, a good ground and then a lot of hard work involved yeah it was a good grounding to say the least really um dave was great to me i was so young and naive when i went now i mean the day i left school i packed my bags and i was gone um but i was riding out there whilst i was at school and had my first ride as an amateur for Dave whilst I was still at school. And um, yeah, it was uh, yeah the start of something, that's for sure. Yeah. And then you ended up at, at Richard Hannon's, but you didn't have like a an overnight success, as it were, as an apprentice. It took you like a couple of years to, to really bang the winners in and find your feet and, and get to that stage where you were like a regular sort of race winner, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, I was a bit of a slow burner, really. I, you know, my first ride was a winner. So when you, you know, you start off, like that you think oh, things are going to be you know not easy but uh it was a great start and um things weren't easy in the end and um you know nothing really came you know i, I was well able to ride i just the race and the race riding was there but the um you know things just took a while for you know things to kind of the penny to drop really mm. and why why did it take so long for that penny to drop was it like was it a physical thing was it a mental thing or what what was it that took you so long to to get the hang of um, I don't know really. Like, I was small, very small, very weak. I, I remember having my first ride, and I was like five stone or something. And um, I, because I, I started off as an amateur, because I wanted to ride whilst I was still at school. Because obviously, to be an apprentice, you have to have left school and mm. um, to hold an apprentice license. So I wanted to kind of get going as soon as I turned sixteen. And I remember my first ride; I had about ten five or something, and I was like five seven. Um, so I was very small, very weak, and you know I think, you, you know I I just wasn't you know wasn't strong enough to begin with. Yeah, was there also an element of as you've gone through that apprenticeship, being a a girl in sort of a male dominated sport? Did you ever feel like this is harder for me because I'm a girl, or was it always your own sort of personal stuff that you had to work on? Um, I knew that it would be, you know, my dad always said you know you're gonna have to work harder than everyone else because you're a girl, but it never really played on my mind or it was never, you know, I never ever thought I'm not doing well because I'm a girl or anything like that. I'm not getting the chances because I'm a girl. I wasn't getting the chances because I wasn't good enough and I think that's um, just the way it was. When you say you weren't good enough, were you actually not good enough or did you just feel like I'm not good enough? I just felt like I wasn't good enough for, you know, quite a long period of time before, you know, things started to 
turn the corner and then it kind of spiraled quite quickly. Um, yeah, for quite a while I was just a bit like, well, I'm just not good enough. And when I made the move to Richard Hannon's, I thought, well, this is make or break, really. Um, you know, if I don't do well here, then probably not going to make it as a jockey. So thankfully things went the right way. But that, that feeling of I'm not good enough, where does that, where does that come from for you? I don't know, really. I suppose growing up doing the pony racing and probably not being very good, um, you know, in comparison to the other, other, other kids riding, didn't ride many winners. Um, but I never, ever, like, I didn't get the results, but I never felt demoralised, never felt upset or anything like that after I'd ridden a race and finished last or, you know, whatever. It never used to bother me. So I think that was quite a good way of getting grounded, really. Mm, OK. And then you eventually did get going and you hit the ground and start riding a few winners. What did that feel like for you? When was the, the moment where you thought, this is sort of happening now? Um, I know I, you know, I said I always felt like I wasn't good enough to begin with, but I always knew that I could do it. Oh, there was always something in the back of my mind where I, was, I knew I, you know, if I had it was chance, I could do it. Yeah. yeah, I knew I could do it. It was just so frustrating because I just couldn't put it all together. And then one day, I used to ride a, little, a horse called Aguari for Richard Hannon. Yeah. And then um, one day I went from looking like, like, you know, not very good to the penny just dropped one day and I looked all right and I thought, oh, here we go. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, and things, you know, escalated from there and, yeah. Did that feeling, like that penny just clicking, did that give you the belief to think, oh, I can go on now and I can really kick on with this career and, and be something? Yeah, definitely. I knew I had, like, the drive the hunger and all the dedication I just wasn't I didn't have the talent at the time and um everyone I think everyone operates at different rates like if you look at Tom he's always been so naturally gifted mm. and the, you know things just you know he he just took off straight away and there's other jockeys that take years to get going I think I was just one of those but looking back I, I wouldn't change it yeah and then you ended up with that association with with Archie Watson which has yielded loads of success but how did that association start and how did it turn into this wonderful relationship that you guys seem to have now? Um, well, at the time, I think I was still an apprentice working for Richard Hannon and um, I was getting a few rides off Archie and um, then a few months later, I'd lost my claim and I didn't take me long to, you know, I knew before I, I'm quite, you know, realistic. I knew before I lost my claim, I was like, it's going to be hard. It's, it's hard for everyone. Mm. I was um, a very small fish and a Big pond there, obviously, you had Sean Lee, Pat Dobbs, Tom at the time. Um, you know, I think Cam Hardy was there. Plenty of really good riders. And I kind of knew my where my place was going to lie. Um, I was a lightweight jockey. And did I want to just be a, a lightweight jockey? Um, not really. And um, Archie was kind of up for giving me opportunity. So I had to make the decision because with Richard Han, you're either in or you're out, isn't it? I, you know. You, you, you'll see it, you're either in or you're out, and there's no kind of in between. And mm. I kind of had to make that decision at the time and um, kind of made the move over to Archie's, and things have escalated from there. But it's a pretty big decision to make at that point in your career where you're, like I said, it's a difficult transition going from apprentice to professional, but then to take that step out of an established stable like Richard Hannon to go to someone. And Archie wasn't really the force he is now back then, although he was an up and coming trainer. So it must have been like, must have taken some thinking about, surely. Yeah, it wasn't a, a very easy decision because I loved, loved it at Richard Hannon's. You know, I, I wanted to be there. I wanted to be part of the team and have a place there. But realistically, I want to be a champion jockey one day. And was that going to happen? I didn't think so. Um, so, I, you know, sometimes you've got to do what's best for you. Yeah. And it's worked out because I think you and Archie have almost sort of grown together as a force since you since you joined them and it's ended up with multiple group one successes. Let's start with the first group one, Glen Shield Champions Day. How was that that feeling for you after everything you'd sort of been through and the the difficult sort of transition periods and the slow burning apprenticeship? You get the champions there in Glen Shield and it was a photo finish, wasn't it? Because I remember it. And you you pulled it out of the bag in the photo finish. What's that feeling like immediately, that emotion when you realise I've won this. Yeah, it was um, unbelievable because obviously it was a photo finish and I think everyone could see by my expressions as to how, you know, how amazed I was. Um, you know, and 
you know, all credit to Archie, no one else would have won a group one with Glenn Shield, mm. you know, and it just goes to show, you know, what he's capable of and, you know, given the chances, you know, we're quite a good team. Yeah. Because I remember I got beat on Glenn Shield over, it was a mile and a quarter, I brought him in France, France or something, yeah. and he, he'd won over a mile and a quarter and he yeah. just kept, I just kept figuring out, yeah, let's step him back and step him back. And he, like I said, I don't think anyone else would have won with him either. But what I'm interested in is more the emotion when that pitch was called out. Obviously, it's a, it's a bit of a surprise and there's a lot of emotions going on. What was the main emotion for you? What did you feel immediately? Just, I don't know. I just never thought that I'd be in a position to ride a group one winner ever, really. Was there a relief? Um, yeah, was relief. But I was aware that, like, you know, it was early days in my, it, you know, it was, what, nearly three years now. So it, it felt like it was still early days in my career. Like, I don't expect anything to come quickly or easily. And then I was just so shocked and amazed. I, you know, then it makes you a bit greedy, doesn't it? Because when you get a taste of that high-level success, you just want more and more. Yeah. And luckily, that relationship with Archie has continued and you've, you've found a couple of more group one winners along the way. What I'm interested in as well is... Because obviously I worked for Archie and I was kind of like your number two for a little period of the time. Could never get past you. But I thought we worked quite well together and, and I obviously had my relationship with Archie and he gave me sort of similar instructions generally most of the time. And I had a lot of freedom, I felt like, when I rode for him. Do you have a lot of freedom? Does he tie you down with instructions or how does that relationship sort of work? Uh, no, he, I have a lot of freedom. Um, it's very easy to ride for and I think that's what works, Ray, cause we ride out there quite a lot and know the horses inside out and he trusts you to know um their characteristics and what suits them and um I, f I find it very straightforward never any pressure you know if something's not going right that he won't like you know you know i know i know what he he, he likes and what he doesn't like so i think once you've figured that out it's um it's you're, you're halfway there aren't you has he ever told one told you that you've given one a bad ride has he ever complained um have you had a little fallout at any stage no no fallouts um, I'd, I'd tell him if I'd given one a bad ride, or I should have done this, should have done that. Um, but, you know, at this point in your career, you should be realising those things. Yeah. So I feel like when I rode from, I obviously gave a couple of them bad rides, because you can't give everything a good ride. There's a couple I gave bad rides, and I rang him up, and I was like, Arch, I've given that fucking terrible ride. I'm really sorry. And he was always like, no, don't worry about it. It happens. And he, he never, like I said, put that pressure on you and sort of gave you that freedom to forget about it and move on to the next one. Yeah, he's pretty good like that. Like, if things haven't gone right, he's usually very understanding and, um, you know, you want to ride the horse to give it, the, you know, the best chance of winning and the least excuses of not, not winning. So, um, you know, if things haven't fallen right, he's pretty good at um, understanding why. Yeah. And a another big association you have is with Imad al Cigar, and that obviously led you to Nashua. And it's another massive achievement was to win your first classic in the Prix de Diane. What was that feeling like? Was that different to the Group 1 win on Glen Shield? What, what was the emotion like when you crossed the line on, on Nashua? Yeah, that was one of the biggest thrills I've ever had, really, to win a classic. Um, nuts, I mean, for him, I'd especially use, you know, when I got that job, it kind of opened a few more doors. You know, I was running for Joel Gosson, Roger Charleston, people like that who probably definitely wouldn't have used me very much before I had that job. And when I got to ride these horses for him and it kind of let me prove myself to them because I have never found it a problem being a female at all but um, I've always found like I personally ha I want to try harder to prove to them that mm. I'm worthy of riding that horse Yeah. so it let me do that so you, you feel like you're in your own head you're constantly having to prove yourself do you still have that now oh yeah I still have still have that now and I think that's you know it's quite healthy to have and it's what drives me do you think it's healthy <laughs> Well, I think it's good. It's keep, you know, I've, I've got that hunger and drive behind me still. Yeah. So. And then let's talk a little bit about outside of racing and what you do outside of racing. What are your hobbies on a day off? What's what's Holly Doyle getting up to? Um, wow. The last few years, I've not had many days off. <laughs> but when I do, I try and use them to kind of, sound stupid, but like recover. You know, because we're so busy and do a bit, quite a lot of training in the gym and um, that's all good and well. But, you know, unlike other athletes and other sports, we don't actually have time to let our bodies recover, really, mm. from what we're doing, you know, with the riding and, and the gym. So try and use it as a day to kind of readjust, you know, sort everything out and, you know, sort my body out for the day and hopefully put it back in line to go again. And how, how are you going about that recovery? What are you doing to 
to get your body back in in the shape that you needed to be um well obviously rest don't get the chance to rest but i'll always make a conscious effort to do something on the day off even whether it's to go for a swim or something um because when you stop i always feel worse when i've stopped you know if i if i haven't ridden out in the morning i have to go out and go and do something because i just feel awful so is that is that mentally or physically a bit of both <laughs> Why, why do I you feel, feel like worse? My body seizes up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel guilty, uh, you know, a feeling of guilt if I haven't done something towards my riding, even on a day off. Where does that feeling of guilt come from? Have you ever thought about it? No. Why not? <laughs> but it doesn't well, make I'm sense to you. I'm all these feel... great opportunities to kind of ride at the highest level, and I feel like I owe it to whoever I'm riding for to be the best I can. But you think the answer to that is, I've got to be doing something on my day off as well? But I've got to be making myself in the best possible way mentally and physically to perform as well as I can. But I'm interested to know where does that come from? Because surely, like, I would have thought at this point, with the Group 1 success you've had and the association with trainers that you had, that you'd start, or most people think you might just relax a little bit and think, almost think I've, I've made it now and I can relax and get into a routine. But you're obviously not that way. Um, I've got a routine, definitely, but I no, I'm not that, that way. I've seen... Over the years, because I've been brought up in racing, jockeys get to a point, like you say, relax, think, oh, this is nicer, made it, and then fall off the edge of a cliff and very conscious of that happening. So I'm just always trying to push to keep keep things going forward. So is it, is it like a fear thing? Probably fear of failure. Yeah. And is that, has that gotten worse with the more success you've had or has it gotten better? What do you mean, worse or better? Because I think... It depends if you think it's a bad thing or a good thing. You were, I don't know if it's a bad thing or a good thing, but I think with the mo it seems to me the more success you've had, or, or I felt like the more success I had, the more afraid of failure I was. Because now you've had it, yeah. and you don't want to let it go. Exactly, so you... Yeah. Do you yeah, go I overboard with it? Yeah, that's the case. Probably, you know, I've, you know, I've ridden at the highest level and had huge success. I, I don't want to go back to how things were before. I mm. want to stay at this you know, this tier and easier said than done, isn't it? Yeah. So you think, do you think you have to be obsessed with racing in order to be successful? Um, I am obsessed with racing and I don't know, you know, you don't know everyone inside out, but I think you have to have a bit of obsession to operate at the highest of levels. Where do you think that comes from? Was that like drilled into you when you were younger or is that something you've just thought through yourself as your own thought process? I'm um, not sure, really. Just sitting back and watching other jockeys and their do's and don'ts and things like that probably yeah. has helped. And how... Because I think there's a... Obviously, I know you and Tom really well. And I think there's a big contrast between you guys in that you are both obsessed, obviously, and you have to be to a degree because you're both at the real pinnacle of a, a really tricky, difficult sport. But Tom seems to, on his days off, wants to go and drive a go-kart, swim in a lake... He wants to do something completely outside of racing. Does he have to like drag you out of the house to get you to do that stuff? Yeah. I like my routine, I like to go and ride out, go to the gym and then do my, sort myself out, sort of things out that need to. Tom likes to do the opposite, yeah. <laughs> which is fine. And, and I like doing other things too, but I'm really um, anal with routine and I hate breaking it. It really stresses me out. It's a little bit like, have you seen the Tyson Fury documentary? Yeah. He's a bit like that as well. Mm. Maybe it's like a common theme with some sports people that like you have to have that. Yeah, I think those types of things normal people do. Maybe I'm not normal, but they that's a... Um, it switches them off, getting off and doing stuff like that. I was even on holidays or going out for the day, I can switch off. Really? So if you're, if you're on holiday laying on a beach, are you thinking about... Nashua, Brad Sell. You, you're still thinking about racing? Yes. Not thinking about your pina colada? Mr. Tom's disgust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Tom. So I always thought that potentially that maybe you guys might get a little bit sick of the sort of race and media constantly being on the whole Tom and Holly type thing. And there's this narrative, I think, that Sometimes people say, oh, it's, it's incredible that these two sports people are managing to keep a marriage going because it's like you're so busy and whatever. But I think anybody who knows you and Tom sort of closely realise that actually 
it's not not to say that it's not difficult, but it, of course it makes sense because you guys are just a couple in love. Yeah, it's strange, really, isn't it? I suppose from the outside looking in, but it's something that I, in particular, have got used to now. Whereas before, Tom was very chilled about everything like that, and I was a bit uptight and not. It doesn't come natural to me. I feel it doesn't come natural. Maybe it doesn't look that bad, but I feel media doesn't come natural to me but it does to Tom and probably took me quite a long time to get used to it um like but from my point of view now I just be myself and it's not that hard if you're not having to not be yourself really yeah but then do you feel like sometimes you'd rather have so it's not like you're on the cover of OK magazine but there is still like a lot of media sort of frenzy around you and Tom would you rather there was a little bit less of that and you could have a bit more of a private life or does it does it not really bother you that much? Um, it doesn't bother me anymore, really. I suppose it did. It used to bother me a little bit, but I think now the media have got to know Tom and I personally a little bit more. They're a lot more respectful, and um, I, I don't mind it anymore. Yeah, no, that's good because I, I, I'd find it difficult if me and my girlfriend had to like deal with ITV coming over with a camera and ask us about our relationship. <laughs> I'm sure I'd be able to hack it, to be honest. I think, I think they'll get bored of asking the same questions because they're only going to get the same answers so yeah. they probably wear off. Yeah, you guys don't really sort of change much. So you've been together since you were like, what, 13, 14? So. Yeah, I've known Tom since I was 14. Yeah, no, so it's, it's probably not going to change all that now, is it? <laughs> no, exactly, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so there must be something if you could... If you could switch off from racing and you could get away from it, what do you think you would be doing if you were going to have a, a hobby outside of racing? What are you interested in? Uh, obviously racing still, but I'm interested in the pedigree side of things and the breeding and also, you know, dealing with yearlings. I'm interested very much in that. Also much that Tom's discussed. Yeah. <laughs> So it'd still be yeah, like be horses. horses. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that that's just because your does your mum have some what, what kind of breed are they? Yeah, my mum breeds Arabs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'd probably be doing something like that, I'd imagine, if you not with Arabs. Maybe not Arabs. No, yeah. Arab breeds. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go back a little bit to horsemanship because obviously we're not going to get away from the subject. One thing I want to know is, and I've asked a couple of jockeys like similar questions, but when you're riding a horse, for people who are listening to this and have never sat on a horse, or more specifically a race horse, and they don't know what that feeling's like. You're on a half ton animal full of energy and they're a lot stronger than you are. What are you doing with your hands? Or how are you getting them to relax? Can you explain that like in the, the simplest terms to people who wouldn't understand it? Yeah, it's hard to explain really. Um, horses are very sensitive animals and you know they can feel what you're feeling so Obviously, I'm lucky because I've ridden horses all my life, but um, I suppose people that haven't and have to learn how to ride, it's not easy. Um, but horses are incredibly sensitive, and um, I feel like, you know, your hands in particular are, are the tools, really, to get them to relax, you know. Um, you know, I remember when I was a kid, and um, I went, I used to ride ride out with my dad, and when I was really young, he used to clip the lead rope onto my pony and drag me up the road, and I was like, to this one pony, and... Um, I went from a kick along lead rein pony to a little mini thoroughbred racing pony and he le le let me go one day and it ran off of me and I stood up, bolt up right my hands up here and he was just screaming, hands down, hands down. And I was like, I remember I pulled out and I started crying. I was like, I can't ride on that, I can't do it. And um, I learned the hard way and my dad, you know, he was a very good good rider. He has hands like shovels, a yeah. bit like, you know, he's like um, the same kind of era as like, you know, he rides like a bit like Davy Russell, hands down, mm. like shovels. And yeah. So I kind of used to watch watch him ride, and um, I think that's really important to have good hands. Yeah. But it's something that a lot it comes very natural to a lot of people, and others it doesn't. Yeah. Some people like me and you probably have to work pretty hard on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, who would you like as you're going through your apprenticeship or before you're even a jockey? Who are you modelling yourself on? Are you trying to look like another jockey, or are you just? trying to figure out your own unique style or how, how did that work for you? Um, when I was very young, I used to really idolise like <coughs> Kathy Gann and Kira Fallon and Ryan Moore and I used to really want to like growing up, you'd be like, I want to ride like them, I want to use my stick like that or do this and I got to a point where I, I wasn't going to be able to do that so I just accepted it and 
found my own style and adapted it and that's when things started to kind of snowball for me mm. um i think it's very hard to try and replicate someone because um you'll notice like everyone's built differently it's so um you know even you know the proportions of your legs your body your arms it's it all it's all um influential on your style and how you use your stick in certain ways it's mm. you know it's it's not one dimensional that's for sure yeah let's talk a little bit about sacrifices because I'm, I'm going to be speaking to pretty much all the jockeys about this i felt like during my career there was a lot of stuff i missed out on because i was so dedicated to racing and the fixture list was so crazy and i was making weight or whatever it might have been so i missed birthdays weddings meals with family or whatever it might have been how much of that have you missed have you do you feel like you've had to make a lot of sacrifices to to be in the position that you're in um yeah definitely i think it's part and parcel of the job unfortunately that's the bad side of racing really we don't have any well i know we're self-employed and we could choose to take a week off here and there but it doesn't work like that you and i both know i've missed weddings funerals you name it over years and at the time when i was younger i never wouldn't blink didn't think anything of it but looking back now no i'm married i even missed being a bridesmaid once because i said i'm going racing and now imagine i got married and if one of my best friends had said that i'd have been mortified so it's only until you get a lot older and you look back and you think god some of the things i've missed because i've been so obsessed with going racing it's strange <laughs> so do you regret those now do you do you look back and think i, I wish i'd been different and I'd, I'd gone to that wedding as a bridesmaid and and maybe not miss the family meals or, or even funerals which is a really difficult one yeah definitely i mean you know now i'm older and you know a lot of your older family download or starting to get old you um do realize how much you have to kind of cherish those days with the family and things like that mm. how much does that like weigh on you now when you think about stuff do you feel like, guilty about that sort of stuff does it still pop in your head every now and again or is it or are you able to sort of get over it now and move on um i think yeah i do feel a bit guilty but like my family working have worked in racing like my mum was a traveling head girl and my dad's worked in racing all his life and they'd almost be a bit similar mm -hmm. so i think they are very understanding and um yeah my family are very understanding but it is strange isn't it yeah do you think you make a conscious effort in future to to not miss stuff like that would you would you be confident enough now to say i'm not going to go to Wolverhampton because i've got best friend's wedding would you be able to do that now do you think i think so now yeah, yeah. obviously i've just yeah, a few years ago, probably not. But uh, now, yeah, now I've had a few realizations over the last few years. Life's too short. Yeah. How do you how do you come to those realizations? Is it just an age thing, getting older, or are you thinking about things? Has someone said something to you? What creates those realizations? Um, yeah, I suppose you get older and you mature, and like like when I got married, it made me when all my family came to my wedding and that's the first time in my life that my family have all been in the same place and I've been there mm. with them. So. I don't know when that's next going to happen, really. Yeah. <laughs> and until my brother gets married or something. So that's quite sad to think. You know, I've got a lot of family in Ireland that I haven't seen for two years since I last since I got married. So yeah, um, yeah I suppose it's it's a hard one, but something that I'm probably going to try and make more of a conscious effort towards. Mm. And that that wedding, because I was at the wedding, was lucky enough to be there. <laughs> Can you tell us how that felt? Because I want to get a bit more away from racing again. How that felt for you and Tom, who'd been, you know, a couple of years, like, what was it, 13, 14? Not only sure for that many years to finally find a little gap in the calendar to get, because I know it was a bit of a struggle to organise as well with the, the fixture list and yeah. trying to get everyone the same place at the right time was, was a bit of a struggle, wasn't it? So what was that feeling like? I'm not trying to compare it to riding Nashua and the Prix de Diane, but that walk up the aisle to, to finally get married to Tom, what was that like? Um, yeah, it was a very different, like, it's not comparable to my riding achievements. It's mm. completely different. Um, but it was surreal because, like, obviously I've known Tom for so many years, but it, I still felt like, oh, I'm so young. You yeah. know, I felt so young and it felt so... so you, were you sweet. getting, like, cold feet? Or... No, not at all. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I don't know, it was weird because people get married after two or three years of being mm. together and I'd been with Tom so long. But, um, no, it was, yeah, it was surreal and, like, with all my... Mine and Tom's family being there was very special. Mm -hmm. I, I, 
I remember quite a lot of the ceremony and then got to the after and I don't remember an awful lot after because I drank an awful lot of vodka. <laughs> but I think it was probably one of the best nights I've ever had because it was like I said, all your, your family were over and quite a lot of racing people there as well, but it was just a brilliant night, wasn't it? Yeah, it was great. I mean, we did. it wasn't a massive wedding, was it? There mm. weren't hundreds and hundreds of people there, but we made it quite um, a conscious effort to invite the right people. Mm. Um, wanted it's it to be quite well. small and, mm. um, you know, tight-knit, and thankfully it worked out well. And then you get up on the mic at one stage? No. <laughs> yeah, you did. What did you sing? You and Tom got up and did a little duet, didn't you? We did, yeah. Because like there's, there's pictures of this, so you can't deny it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually thought you sang, and you can sing a little bit as well, can't you? Really. I feel like you're not. You, what you rate as being able to sing. If, if I asked your mum now, she'd say Holly's a brilliant singer. She'd say I'm brilliant at anything, though. You know what she's like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but even your dad, okay, he's a bit harsh. He'd probably say you're a good singer as well. Maybe, yeah. Was that something you ever considered when you were younger? Like a singing career? No. When you were like 12, 13, watching X Factor? Never crossed your mind? Well, no, no. Why not? No, I don't like to get a jacket. <laughs> Too busy with the horses? Yeah. If you could have, looking back now, do you think might give the X Factor a pop? I wouldn't have. Been, I couldn't have thought of anything worse. I'm really standing, you know, no, being in front of. Us, you know. So are you, are you one of those singers that only likes to sing like in private? In the car. In the car, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's your um, you go to car if you had? To, I know you wouldn't like to. You had to belt out karaoke, put you on the spot. What would you be singing? The Coldplay or something. The Coldplay. Yeah. Which one? It's a little paradise. So I'd love to, you're going to kill me for this. Your rendition of Nicki Minaj's Super Bass, you know every single word. I think you could get up on the mic and, but we're not going to ask you to do it right now. Definitely not. But you could get up on the mic and belt that out, couldn't you? I could do, yeah, but you could do. not very well. So how, how old are you when you learn Super Bass? I don't know, it's just off the blink yet. <laughs> off the radio. Learning, I didn't sit there and read the words, I'm going to learn this. So I just <laughs> like, just happened. you heard it that many times, it got <laughs> yeah. stuck in there. Okay, fair enough, yeah, we'll give you that one. I'd have, I think it would be a better story if you were reading it off a sheet, trying to learn it and made a conscious effort. <laughs> that would have sounded better. But at least everybody knows now that you know a bit of Nicki Minaj, which is something they might not have known before, yeah. which is great. <laughs> um, let's go back to racing again. What's the future hold for Holly Doyle? Because you, you've broken the record for number of winners in the calendar year for a female jockey, second in the jockey championship joint with Tom last year. What's the ambition? What do you... What do you see happening in the next five, ten years? What would be the point for you where you'd look back and say, yeah, I made it, I did it? I don't think I'll ever be the kind of person that sits back and says I made it or... Because I don't know where the like, ceiling is for my career, but I want to be champion jockey one day, but it's going to be hard. Yeah. Um, so trying to find little ways and changes of adapting things to put me in the best possible um, best possible, what's the word, chance of mm. winning it. And what, what are those little changes that you're trying to make? Is there something you could tell us that you might have changed recently that is kind of putting you towards that goal of, of being champion jockey? No, it's really hard because people say, oh, well, you, you're going to the championship this year or, you know, you're giving it a go. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I'm always trying to ride as many winners as I can. Mm. Like, I'm always trying my best. And You're never not trying to be champion. Right, I like think my agent's trying to get me on the best rides every day all year round when I'm here. So it's really hard to kind of distinguish what needs to change. Mm. Obviously, I'm always trying to improve as a rider, so that's something that I'm obviously working on. And, um, yeah, it's really hard to kind of pinpoint the small things that need to change to put me in the, a step forward. Yeah. What about sort of like outside of your racing life in terms of that ambition, whether it be a big mansion, Rolls Royce, Bentley? Have you got any ambitions outside of racing in your life that you'd like to achieve in the next five or ten years? Or is it solely let's do the race and then everything else can figure itself out? Yeah, that's it. I'm focusing on my career and everything else will figure itself out in time. But I know nothing lasts forever, so I'm trying to ride this wave for as long as I can and keep pushing forward and keep the ball rolling and at this level and see where it gets me. Okay, interesting. I'm gonna leave you at two final questions and I'm, I'm asking these to every jockey that we have on. So if you could look back in your career now and you go back and change one thing, what would you change? Um, 
probably at the start of my career, I just you know, just calm down, let things happen instead of trying to force things, trying to, I was so frustrated for many years because I was kind of, everyone was kind of um, not overtaking me, but getting on with their career and things were going well. And I was just kind of in the same position. But looking back now, I should have not compared myself to everyone else's rate of success and just calm down and trust the system. <laughs> Do you still compare yourself to other people's rate of success now or is that something you've... No, that's with? completely... Um, as you get older, you don't. That kind of ties into my next question, which would have been if you could give a piece of advice to your younger self. You could see little Holly Doyle, young Holly Doyle, 10 years ago, five years ago, and you could give her a piece of advice. What would you say to her? Chill out. Chill out. <laughs> Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> yeah, I was just so hungry and obsessed and wanted success, and things just don't happen overnight, do they? Yeah. Would you be a bit more conscious of maybe trying to enjoy it more? Because I feel like jockeys don't, because you're so busy moving on to the next one, you don't really get that time to enjoy mm. what you've actually achieved. Would, do you think you could well, maybe enjoy it a bit more? Yeah, I suppose the question is, how do you enjoy it? Like, mm. what's your way of enjoying something? Yeah. Like, we don't get the chance to kind of have a day off and have the family around to celebrate. You move on to the next, you know, once you've passed that winning line, job done, what's next? That's mm. how I see it. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks for coming on. It's been great to have you. I know I've asked you some difficult questions and exposed your Nicki Minaj love to the world, but it's been great to have you on and we're going to be watching you with a lot of interest over the next couple of months and years. Thank you. Thanks, Ollie.